very cheerful good morning to everyone. Welcome to our worship service today. Uh, my name is uh, Philip Schuchman, as you see in your bulletin. Uh, not recently, but uh, retired. Uh, Happy to help out today. In order to help us in our worship for today, we'll follow the order of service on page 26. That's uh, Christian worship. And you'll find the hymns uh, in the blue hymnal. So we'll begin by singing the first hymn. us to come to his presence and worship him with humble and <coughs> hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am my nature sinful, and that I have been disobeyed to my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment. Both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and, and trust in my Savior Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now I suspect that many of you came to church for different reasons today. But I hope the primary reason that you're here, every one of you, is to be reminded that all of your sins are forgiven in Christ. And so now, this is the most important part of the service. We're going to hear that most excellent of news. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. 
and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, you just heard that your sins are forgiven. If you just won a prize for a trip around the world, or a new car, is that what you'd say, Megan? Well, well. Amen means, so shall it be. In other words, I heard what you said, and now I want to believe that. So I'm going to end this, and let's hear a long, strong amen. I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Very good. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all of your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O oh Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. His name is worthy of praise.
Okay, Amos chapter 7. Then Amos, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Now this is the priest that's going to send this message. And he isn't going to want to hear from God's prophet. And wouldn't that be the same way today? How many of you would feel comfortable confronting a politician or a president or a governor or a senator that is immoral and sinning and doesn't have any faith? And that was the work of the prophets in the Old Testament quite often. So then Amos, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to endure all of his words. This is what Amos says. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go into exile away from its own soil. Then Amaziah said to Amos, You see her, get out of here. Flee to the land of Judah. You may eat food and prophesy there, but you must never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is in the sanctuary of the king and the national temple. Then Amos responded to Amaziah, I was a prophet, I was not a prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. Rather, I was a sheep breeder, and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending flocks, and the Lord said to me, I'll go and prophesy to my people Israel. That far the first lesson. We'll continue with our singing of the song for today. Our psalm is Psalm 25. chapter 1 and reading at the fifth verse. We first of all in the first lesson saw what the work of a faithful prophet should be. Now we have outlined for us what the work of a, a pastor or someone who's a leader in the church should be. And that should be a meaningfulness to you as you have one pastor retiring and you soon will have a, a new pastor. The reason I left you in Crete was so that you would set in order the things that were left unfinished and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Such a man is to be blameless, the husband of only one wife, and to have believing children who are not open to a charge of wild living or disobedience. Indeed, an overseer, since he is God's steward, must be blameless not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not a drunkard, not violent, not eager for dishonest gain. Instead, he must be hospitable, loving what is good, self-controlled, upright, devout, and disciplined. He must cling to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he will be able to encourage people by sound teaching and also to correct those who oppose him. That far, the second lesson. And blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Alleluia.
The Holy Gospel for today is recorded in Mark chapter 6 and reading at the 7th place. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that area. Any place that will not receive you or listen to you, as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That far the gospel lesson. We'll continue by singing hymn 816. You may be seated. change that. 
But I think most of you know that stress kills. It can divide families. It can cause trouble in the workplace. If you're anxious about something, maybe you don't sleep well at night. Well, what causes stress and anxiety and unhappiness? I think for some people, depending upon where you live, maybe it's the, the culture, the environment that you live in. Some of you may know I spent the last almost 50 years of my ministry in the Illinois area, mostly Chicago. It's much more stressful to drive around here. I almost ran into a car this morning. And it was going a lot faster than I was expected because it was the only one on the highway. Maybe you think your lifestyle is a little bit slower and a little bit more relaxed here in central Wisconsin. I'm sure for some of you it is. I thought it was a fast-paced lifestyle in Chicago until I met somebody from L.A. He said, this is just like slow living here in the Midwest. Maybe it's anxiety over being sick. Or wondering how your children are going to fare if maybe they're in line to go to war someplace in the world. I had a grandson over in northern Italy was on pins and needles. They were going to send him off to the Middle East. Maybe his parents were more so. But I'd like to suggest to you this morning that reasons for real stress and anxiety in life go much deeper than just our experiences. They start with the soul of a country. They start with the families in the country that have lost their values, their standards. Sometimes you just want to say, how dare does a politician or a salesman or an educator look us in the eye and tell us something that is patently untrue? When you've lost integrity and when you've lost honesty and values, stressful living goes right along with that. Another thing that causes stress is values above our expectations. People expect a whole lot more out of life than even God demands. And if you're running the rat race of life trying to live up to somebody else's expectations, that's going to cause stress too. Where you send your kids off to college, is it really that important? And maybe after you've seen what's coming out of the colleges the last few months, you want to be a lawyer, send your kid to night school. Have him learn the law, start winning some cases. You won't worry about whether he went to Harvard or Columbia. Having the right kind of clothes. I don't see too many teenagers here today, but wearing the right kind of tennis shoes to a sporting event. You can't believe the stress that that can cause young people some days, not living up to somebody else's expectations. The body beautiful? How's your hair done? Where you get it done? Where are you going to take your vacations? This weighs on an awful lot of people's minds. So I'd like to direct you this morning if you're feeling stressed out or anxious in your life to the stress reliever. And that's to Jesus. But maybe you already knew that. Jesus is the one that comes into our lives and he wants to give us peace. <coughs> he wants to give us a relationship with himself and a calming relationship with others through love. 
I'd like to zero in this morning on four P's. The first one is perspective. Shortly before Jesus was to go to the cross, he got his disciples together in an intimate room and he began to talk to them about their future. They were anxious. They were stressed. They didn't know what was going to happen. Their leader, their master, their teacher was going to go away. And they just didn't understand this business about the cross. And so Jesus told his disciples, <clears throat> he said in this world, he said, you can finish the sentence. He said in this world, he said, you have trouble. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. And he said, in me is peace. The devil has inflicted a moral chaos on this world and uncertainty that sinners have a hard time getting their arms around. <coughs> but Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. How did he do that? He did it by going to a cross and paying for the sins of the entire world. He did it by living a life that would show us his perfection give us his perfection and lead us through our life. Jesus overcame the world and he certified it by his death on the cross. And the Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesians, explains to us what that means. It means, he says, that Jesus has ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God and God has placed all things under his feet, and he rules over the world in the interest of his church. Now let's make that practical. What does that mean? He rules over the world in your interest. The church is believers. And that means that Jesus is in charge of your life. He's going to take care of you. And you don't have to worry about who wins the election. Because who is going to watch over and take care of you is going to be the same almighty God. And I don't know how many of you read Forward in Christ, but there's an excellent article by Charlie Digner, Pastor Charles Digner, former district president in what was the current issue. I don't know if there's a more recent one out yet. But in there, he, he explains to people. You listen to CNN, you listen to Fox, you listen to ABC, CBS. What are they selling? They're selling fear. <coughs> Gets you to be afraid. Listen to our product. It's all about sales. It's all about money. It's all about entertainment. They don't know who's going to rule if they don't know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're fearful about who's going to rule, remember who's in charge. It's your Savior. Jesus says in this world you have trouble. He wants you to know, he wanted his disciples to know that living even as a disciple or a Christian doesn't mean your life is going to push up roses all the time. How many of you have troubles in your life right now? I'd be surprised if there weren't quite a few of you that did. And you just don't know. My wife and I stayed up here in uh, McCann, uh, what is that, uh, Outfitters? On 23 minutes last night. Some of you know my son in law, John Stelter. He's a pastor in um, Princeton. And uh, he had his 49th birthday, no, 41st birthday. Better get that closer. 
yesterday, so we celebrated that with them. But we were at the um, restaurant there uh, just a little after um, six o'clock, and there was a loud crash outside, and there were at least one fatality, maybe two, three cars. Boom, just like that. Hello, I'm a baby. And then the rain came and the lightning, it was pouring rain like no tomorrow on this accident while well attending people were trying to, to save lives. And then we walked inside and the TV's on and somebody just shot the former president. Sounds to me like in this world you have trouble, right? And it can happen in the flash of an eye. And Jesus wants you and me to know that. And as we go through our life, he doesn't want us to lose hope. And sometimes he wants us to long for heaven. You ever wonder sometimes why God lets you get old and older and older? I have lots of times I go visit older people and they say, I think God's forgotten about me. I think God wants us to long sometimes to go to heaven because sometimes we just feel like we got things too good in this room. I want the Paw Patrol. But he's there waiting for us and he's promised to prepare a place for us. And he's going to come to take us to be with him forever. That's perspective for Christian living. Along with Jesus' words, I will give you peace. Peace of heart and mind and soul. You're not going to get much peace of living in a sinful world, but you will get peace from the Savior of the world. So remember that. That's perspective for living. That's P. That's one. Let's look at another P. I'm going to call it promise. The Apostle Peter said in the New Testament, he said, cast all of your cares upon me for me, Jesus, because I care for you. He was facing the same kind of world we are, economic disaster, war on the border, unruly rulers, criminals and crooks, people that want to take advantage of you. And his answer to that was, again, to trust Jesus. Who makes promises to you today? I know it's an election year, but just think about it once. Think of all the promises that people are making. Are you really going to put your marbles in the bag of Uncle Sam taking care of you? Or are you going to look to your Heavenly Father who promises rain and sunshine and crops and help? Where is your real help and where is your real strength for day-to-day -day living coming from? Remember the first commandment that we should fear and love and trust in God above all things. God's the one that promises to take care of us and he will take care of us for time and for eternity. That's why he sent his son. What about priorities. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. He says the heathen worry about all of those things. But he said, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. I know a lot of people that struggle with that, those words of Jesus to put their life and their livelihood into the hands of a loving God. But if we're honest with ourselves, most of us will find that God has made good on his promise to take care of us day by day, but more importantly, spiritually. You know, if we don't know what's most important in life, folks, we're going to run the treadmill of life and we're not going to do it anyway. 
If the most important thing is getting to heaven, and we know that, think of all of the day-to-day -day stresses and anxieties that you can just kind of wash away. Not that you're a path, but so best not that you don't take care of your responsibilities, but you begin to understand what's most important. What's most important in raising your children, what's most important in your dialogue with people at work, and what you think about, and what you read, and where Jesus stands in your day to day living. The priorities. And then, oh, by the way, that last P, who's got it? We got perspective, we got promise, we got priorities. What's another great stress reliever? It's called prayer. Don't be anxious about anything, the Apostle Paul says, but in prayer. Come before God. And what's one of the main things that we should pray for? To be thankful. I always tell people, I can tell if you're thankful or not. I really can. How would I do that? I can tell if you're thankful by what you complain about. If you're really thankful, you would be thankful for every breath of air you take. When you complain about things, it means you think you deserve something better than you got. And what do we deserve, every one of us? We deserve to go to hell. And then look what God does for us. He sacrifices his son. He gives most of us good health and day-to-day -day living and good circumstances. And we find it so hard in our life to say thank you. And when we say thank you, remember to say to God and others, I have been blessed. Now you might think this is a little odd after spending almost 50 years in the ministry. I think I finally figured out a definition for being blessed. Have you ever told people that? Had a good year at the office, so God's blessed us. Our family is together, God blessed us. The crops were good this year, God blessed us. I don't think any of those definitions fit. What does it mean to be blessed by God? There's a beautiful hymn in the new hymnal. I think singing that hymn a few times finally dawned on me what it means to be blessed. That hymn says, all is well with my soul. When all is well with your soul, when you know for sure where you're going to go when you die, when all is well with your soul and you know <coughs> when you've shared that with your loved ones and those around you, that they'll be with you too in heaven forever. Doesn't that just sum it up? And then when you talk about all of the other good things God gives you, they're good for you and you'll use them for the glory of God because you know what's most important. That relationship that you have with Him. And you establish that relationship with God when you talk to Him in prayer. And you let His soothing words calm your soul. So, got a little stress going on? I don't need to give it to you this morning. A little anxious about this or that? Go to the stress reliever. Go to Jesus. Use his word, cling to his promises, live a life in the perspective of knowing there's trouble in the world. Trust his promises. And talk to him first. He'll answer. He's your best friend. Amen. And please stand and we'll confess our Christian faith.
We use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated. <coughs> God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand. The beauties of creation, the bounties of the earth, the joy of life, the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word, for your son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and enable us to overcome all things to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the sacrament. Please stand for the thank the Lord.
of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. at a number of different churches and every week it's something different. <laughs> so I hope I didn't confuse too many people today. Uh, some of them are using parts of the new hymnal and parts of the old one and sometimes they're printed out in the bulletin. And, uh, it gets kind of interesting to see how everybody's putting this stuff together using the things they like and kind of holding in abeyance some of the things maybe they, they don't like so well. I would like to say again, you sing marvelously as a congregation, and you're to be commended for that. I'm sure you're going to be missing your 
longtime pastor here for very many years. Uh, but uh, there's a future out there, and I understand you uh, are marvelously blessed by God. The week that uh, the new pastor accepted the call here, I noticed there were about 90 calls out there. 40 of them were returned. Only one person took a call, and that was to this place. So I don't know what you got going up here, but maybe it's the sweet corn, huh? Uh, that, that, that's an amazing thing in, 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 our, um, in our Wisconsin Center today, with as many vacancies we have. So truly, uh, <coughs> truly a blessing to the, the soul of, of this congregation. Um, I don't have any other announcements. Thank the organist for playing today. And, uh, we wish uh, Pastor Plagans and his family uh, safe travels as they uh, went to his daughter's installation, uh, I guess today, so that we're back uh, sometime this afternoon. Anything anybody else has? Okay, closing announcements. Thank you.